Great to be back with you again. Glad that you uh, tuned in with us. We want to continue on this series of uh, love, God's love, in fact. And uh, so I I wanted to share with you about the two great commandments. Uh, And so if you've got your Bibles with you, uh, uh, you can turn to Matthew uh, 22 uh, or your device. You can tune in on your device, your iPad or your telephone or whatever you've got, your phone. Uh, But uh, and if you don't have it, don't sweat it. I've got it right here and I'm going to read it to you. So it's Matthew 22, verse 34 uh, through to about verse 40. And it starts this way. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great, uh, which is the great commandment in the law, or which which commandment is the greatest? Trying to catch him. And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, or is just as important. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So here we go. We're into a situation where we're seeing God is sharing something really cool here for us. He is in a situation where the the Pharisees were like the religious leaders in the, in those days. And so were the Sadducees. And, and it is kind of funny that this scripture verse talks about one group of these religious leaders trying to set up Jesus and trying to catch him for him to to kind of really uh, show who he was, that he wasn't God, that he wasn't uh, this great leader, but that he didn't know the law and he didn't know all the things that needed to happen. In those days, uh, right away when we start talking about the commandments, we'll shoot right to, oh, the Ten Commandments. That has to be what this, this lawyer was talking about. In that time, there was uh, commandments that had been added to the Ten Commandments. These uh, religious leaders would add different laws and rules that people had to follow those rules to be in the right place to get to heaven, to uh, have a relationship with God. They just added different one of these commands together. And so what they were trying to do is get Jesus to pick the wrong one or to pick a one so that they could turn around and say, well, then you mean if you do this, you're okay with God? Or if you do this, you're okay with God? They were setting him up for failure. And that's what they were looking to do. So Jesus turns around and these guys, this lawyer comes with this question. So here we find Jesus comes back with this answer. And he replies back to this this lawyer who's trying to set him up. And this is what he says. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. Wow. Sounds pretty good. So the lawyer kind of absorbing that and kind of going, okay. You know, then all of a sudden there is something that comes from this. There is a stirring in this lawyer that he doesn't understand. Probably in all the people that heard what Jesus said. Because when Jesus released that word, love the Lord your God, there's a stirring that happens in all of us. Even if we're not serving God, even if we don't say that we don't believe in God, there is something within us that there is a desire that has been placed in us from God that we love Him. And we want to share that love back and receive His love to us. See, we were created by God. And when we were created by God, God placed that in us, that desire to receive his love and to return that love because God's whole desire with his creation was to have fellowship. So even if we're serving him, even if we say we don't believe in him, it's down deep inside. And that's why sometimes when somebody talks about the love of God, there's a stirring in you that you just don't understand. I believe this lawyer couldn't understand the kind of the feeling that was going on within him. But all of a sudden, Jesus turns around and almost like takes a breath after saying that. And then he he starts to go on with the second part. 
It's kind of funny. Whenever you ask God something, he seems to always answer with maybe more than one answer than what we started with. But here's what he says. Not only love God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, but then he turns around and he says, I want you to love your neighbor. Uh, what do you mean? I want you to love your neighbor. So here we go. We start thinking, well, you know what? Uh, maybe you don't know my neighbor, God. You know, like... Have you ever met my neighbors? And right away when we say that word neighbor, we start to think the person that lives on either side of the house that we're living in. You know, my next door neighbor here on this side. I'm pretty blessed. I got great neighbors beside me and in front of me. I don't really know the ones uh, right in behind me. But it's bigger than just the neighbors on our street, you know, and now it's on a little like Sesame Street, you know, all the neighbors on the street. Uh, but the reality that comes is, bottom line is, we're to love our neighbors. Neighbors are are people that we work with, people that service at the grocery store. Um, they're all of these different people, people that, that, uh, that we work with, uh, you know, that are all around us, even some people that we struggle with. Those are our neighbors. In other words, Everyone that's around us, everybody that comes into our community, like into our social uh, influence, are those type of people, are our neighbor. Loving your neighbor means loving your community. It's, it's loving those that are around you. Now, loving God sometimes has its, you know, its, its struggles because we don't really understand it all, or we don't really always understand where God is coming from, or we're not always ready to receive but the reality, loving our neighbors seems to go into a whole different realm. We've had difficulties with people, you know, that we're around, people that are a part of who we are in our lives. Loving uh, our neighbors sometimes can become a, a really big struggle and, and can be really hard. So we can love God because he's always pouring out his love to us, that agape love, that, that, that love that he, he gives to us all the time. But loving our neighbors, sometimes, you know, our neighbors are the ones that have got the uh, party going to the wee hours of the morning and the music's blasting or they got a car parked up on their front lawn for the longest time or the grass is, you know, you could lose your kids, the grass is so long or, or it's the person at work that is always on your case trying to push you all the time, give you a hard time. I love the rest of those verses. Did you catch it? God doesn't just return the answer to this lawyer, but he gives him an answer within an answer. Because he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor. And both of those are just as we equal. As God looks at loving him as important as loving your neighbor, but he says a key word in there, as yourself. Wow. What's the importance of that? The importance of that is you can't love your neighbor and maybe not even really love God the way you should until you start to love yourself. So the key here is, is really grabbing hold of what this is. I need to start loving myself. And honestly, if we were speaking to you right here in person, we would probably be able to say, and you're sitting right there listening, that a lot of us struggle with literally loving ourselves. We struggle in that whole situation. And we need to understand that God has got a plan for you and God has got a purpose for you. And, and so we need to know that God loves us. God cares about us. Uh, one of the things that breaks down that relationship between us uh, and us re really receiving the love, which builds us up to start loving ourselves, and that's only going to come from our relationship with God, is can God relate to me? That's one of those areas that becomes kind of a struggle for us. God desires a relationship with us. And, and so I want to kind of look at maybe three different questions. The first one is, can God relate to you? Or God relate to me? Uh, we may wonder, does God really understand 
what it's like to have a spouse like I've got? Does he understand what it's like to maybe have a child uh, that has grown up in a home with an alcoholic parent? Does he understand uh, when I don't have enough money uh, to buy groceries or pay the bills or when I feel all alone and afraid? And all of these are a part of allowing us to receive God's love and take that on in ourselves that we start loving ourselves. Because many of you think you're not worth anything. and I'm no good. God wouldn't care if we're here. Many of you have probably had those moments where you sat and said, you know what, if I wasn't here, nobody would miss me. So I want you to know today, the answer to that question is, yes, God does relate to us. God relates to us. Jesus came from heaven to earth. And he walked here on the earth for 30, 31 years. And when he came to this earth, he did not come as God. He was God, but he took on flesh and blood. He took on all of the, the, the pain and the suffering that mankind took on. He related to what it is to be us walking on this earth. And the reality is he knows what it is to be alone. He knows what it is to be tempted. It says, scripture says, he was tempted in all areas, but did not sin. He knows what it is to be frustrated. Uh, he, he knows what it is to, uh, to kind of lose it. Uh, remember him in the temple? He went into his father's house and they were selling things and he lost his school through the tables around. He knows what it is to lose it. He knows what it is to feel betrayed. He knows what it is to have friends that said they'd have your back, but then when all the pressure came on, they left, you know, and they denied him. He knows what it was to be abused. And he knows what it is to feel that the ones that are the closest to you are no longer there. He knows what it is to suffer. See, Jesus, when he walked on this earth, feels everything. He understands where we're at. He has walked in every footstep that you're walking through. Sickness, sadness, questions, all those questions that you have, he understands them and he's open to them. And he lives a life just like, he lived a life just like what we lived. Second question is, how does God relate to us? So like, how does he do that? He's God. How does he relate to us? Well, I want to tell you, one of the greatest qualities of God is he pursues us. He is after you. He will not give up on you. Doesn't matter what we do, how we turn our back on him. He is after us. He pursues us. He so wants you to know how much he loves you. Secondly, he doesn't give up on us uh, and he doesn't give us what we deserve. Listen, a lot of the stuff that we do, we deserve to to go to hell. We deserve to have the punishment or anything to happen. But God doesn't give that. God is always wanting to give us another chance. God is always wanting to reach out to us. And he never meets us halfway, which is unbelievable. We'd be quite happy if we were meeting somebody, if I if I was going to meet my son in, from Sunridge. Uh, a lot of times what we'll do is if, if it's real busy or bad weather, we'll meet in North Bay. We'll meet halfway kind of thing. And we'll find a restaurant or someplace to meet and we'll see the family and we'll have a chance to get together. So the reality is I want you to know that God sent his son and he didn't send him halfway. He didn't get halfway from between heaven and earth and kind of be in one of those planets someplace like maybe Mars where they're trying to go to now but and meet us halfway. He doesn't meet us halfway. He came all the way from heaven right to the earth that we live in right now. He came all the way to be with us. He understands what we're like. He met the prodigal son in the pig pen. Here's the prodigal son. We talked about that last week a little bit. Here's the prodigal son, the son that wanted his inheritance from his dad, left his dad. And that was a picture of Jesus, you know, and, and us. And, uh, and the heavenly father coming after the prodigal son, pursuing him. And so he finds him in this pig pen. And all of a sudden he comes to his senses and said, it'd be better for me to go home to my dad. And so he heads home. And then we see the dad is on the porch waiting for him. And when he sees him, he jumps off the porch and meets him on the road halfway to bring him back for the celebration of receiving him back. Unbelievable. That story really paints a picture. And in Psalms, let me just read this to you. Psalms 103, verses 10 to 13. He does not treat us as sins desire. 
Really? Or we deserve, or our sins deserve, uh, or repay us according to our iniquities, or the things that we've done wrong. Verse 13 says, As a father has compassion on his child, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Psalms 103 continues to go on. He says, I understand that you're made of dust. See, this is so cool to understand. No matter what you're going through, sometimes you blame yourself and say, well, God will never love me. Look at all the things I've done wrong and all the things that have happened. But bottom line, God understands that we're human. He understands that we're going to make mistakes. He understands that we're not totally transformed as we're going to be when we get to heaven. And the third part is this, what difference does it make in our world, that God loves us. Well, I want you to understand that what does God see when he looks at you? He wants you to know what he sees in you. When God looks at you, and I want you to grab this, maybe take a piece of paper, write this down, write down these points. When God is looking at you, he's saying, I love you. Yeah, God is saying, I love you. Uh, and he's going to prove it. He's going to love on you. He's going to pour blessings on you. He's going to do different things. He loves you. And not only does he love you, the second thing is he's grateful for you. God is so grateful. He is happy that you're alive. He is happy he, you're on the earth. He is happy that he made you. He doesn't go, oh shoot, I made a mistake. No, he is happy that he made you. And so when God is looking at you, all heaven is grateful that you are here right now. Not only are we grateful as a church, not only am I as a pastor, but bigger than that, God is grateful that you're here. And second, the third one is, you're rare. And I know you're going, well, I'm rare, I know I'm rare. But no, you're rare. There's no one like you. God created you just like you are. He made you beautiful. He, he created you. He made you exactly what you look like. When you look in that mirror each morning and you look in there and go, oh my goodness, uh, I can't believe God must, it must have been a Monday. No, God made you perfectly and he sees you as being beautiful just the way you are. Fourthly, he forgives you. He forgives your past. He forgives your, your present and he forgives your future. We talked all about that a couple of weeks ago. And five, he holds you to a higher standard. What do you mean by that? He, ex he is concerned about the things that we do wrong. He is concerned about us going uh, contrary to what the Bible calls for our life. He, he's calling us to a higher standard. Why? Because we're his creation. We're his kids. Listen, how many times have you found yourself listening to your kids say, well, I'm going to date this guy, or I'm going to do this job, or I, I'm going to do this, and you're going in your head, you're going, man, you're so much better than that. You know, nice kid, but he's really not what you deserve in your life. Uh, glad you got a job, but man, you can do so much more with what you got. Well, that's the same way as God's looking at us. He's the same way as you as a parent, kind of looking at your kids. Even deeper, because he knows even everything about you, he is calling you to a higher standard. But I love this. With him calling us to a higher standard, he also gives us grace and mercy. He understands that we're human. That as much as he's wanting us to be the image of him, to be just like Jesus, that's his desire for us. He knows that we're going to stumble. He knows we're going to fall. We're going to come short. And he's not going to throw us out of the boat and give up, give up on us. He's going to pour out grace and he's going to pour out mercy. Then number six is, he has a special calling on you. Yeah, I'm talking to you right where you are. He has a special calling on you. You are a part of his divine plan for this world and for this community, for your family, and for this city. He's got a plan for you, and he doesn't have it really planned out for anybody else. He wants you to do it because he's equipped you to do it. So he has an appointment for you. And last but not least, all heaven is cheering for you to succeed. They are in a place of rejoicing and caring for you. They are excited about what you are going to do and what you are doing. See, time with, with God really builds our relationship. As we start grabbing this and making this a part of our DNA, 
that I am somebody special. I am something. And God loves me and God cares about me. He cherishes me and he's got a plan for me. When we start to get a hold of that and we start to let, you know, God's love touch us, but we start to love ourselves, then we start to find it's not hard for us to start giving love back out to other people. See, if you don't love yourself, how can you love other people? But when you start to love yourself and let that agape love that God is God start touching you, it just goes out to other people. And that's God's plan. God's not only wanting to love us and change us from his love touching our lives, but he knows that if he touches us, we're going to touch other people with his love. So typically, it kind of goes like this. So I brought a little object lesson in. This is, this is a shovel, and that's kind of like what... God is. God's a shoveler. So God all of a sudden has this shovel in heaven. And you know what? He turns around and he says, I love you. So he just scoops up some love and he pours it out on you with a shovel. He just pours out. You need more love? I got more love. Then he turns around and he says, you need mercy? Then he grabs some mercy and he gives you some more mercy. And he says, yeah, it's been a rough time. I'm just going to, I'm just going to shovel out some more. And you need compassion. You've gone through a difficult, you've lost. He just digs into all the compassion he has and he pours his compassion all over us and he intercedes on our behalf and he shovels that onto us. And you need forgiveness? Yeah, you did have a rough week. So here's some forgiveness. I'm going to pour it in. And yeah, you stumbled again. Well, I got some more forgiveness. And you, you stumbled again. Yeah, I got some more. He just keeps shoveling it in. He shovels in love. He shovels in mercy. He shovels in kindness, forgiveness. Uh, he just acceptance. He just keeps shoveling that all the time. And his whole vision of that is not only just to bless you, which is so unbelievable, and he did it just for you, but he wants that to happen to you that transforms you to become a reflection of him. That literally we will start to be the same as him and we'll start to do is we'll start to shovel out all of those qualities that God is shoveling into us onto the people around us. And so all of a sudden we, we start getting around our neighbors and we start being around them and they need to be forgiven. They need to have compassion. They, they need to have some of that poured out on them. They, they need to be encouraged. They need to be lifted up. And so all of a sudden, uh, we start to get to this place that we're pretty open to receive all the blessings that, that God wants to shovel on us, all of those things that he wants to do on us. But sometimes we struggle with our neighbors because we haven't got to the point that we believe in ourselves and have received the love in ourselves. So all of a sudden, we kind of come out with this size of shovel. We kind of come out with a little toy shovel. And, uh, and all of a sudden, our neighbor has done something wrong. You know, our, our kids have done something wrong. Our spouse has done something wrong. And we need to give them forgiveness. And we kind of go like, yeah, well, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pour out some of that forgiveness. But, you know, uh, you always do it, you know, and you're never going to change. Remember those words way back a couple of weeks ago we talked about, you know, and so we we go to pour out some forgiveness, but it's not a big amount, it's a small amount. Uh, maybe compassion, uh, we go to give them some compassion, but they really hurt us and we're kind of going, well, let me think about it, you know, uh, uh, let me take some time and, and I'm going to think about it. And And we hold back on pouring out that love because we don't love ourselves. Uh, and then, heaven forbid, they did something and you need to forgive them. And sometimes we have to turn around and, and we say, well, you know what, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to take time. I'm going to set myself aside and I'm going to pray about this and I'm going to wait till God tells me if I should forgive you. And we know what Scripture said. God says, what I've done to you, you need to do unto others. And you need to forgive people. I know it's not easy. I know what I'm asking is hard. But it will become easier for us to exchange this shovel with a God-like shovel, which is always going to pour out so much more than we ever could imagine over those around us. And the starting point, the starting point is literally when we get to the place that we grab this. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Then love your neighbor 
as you love yourself. When we work on spending time receiving the love that God has for us, knowing that he's grateful for us and happy about us, that we're rare and we're beautiful and he forgives you and, and that he holds us to a higher standard but gives us grace and mercy and, and that there's a special calling and he's cheering us on. When we get that relationship that we realize how much we are loved and we start loving ourselves, it is nothing for us to pour it out to other people. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we are so thankful that you have a huge shovel, that you pour out all of these things on us, that you're cheering us on, that you love us and you care about us, and, and that you have forgiven us. And we thank you so much for the cross that won us freedom and the great commandment that we are to love you, and we thank you for that. But God, we ask you to help us to love those around us the same way as you love us, to pour out that love, and that we understand that we can carry agape love in our lives. Holy Spirit, minister to us in our time with you. Spend time with you, and let your word come alive to us. In Jesus' name, amen. <music>